quiet. There was no whistling, yelling, applauding. It was just this very sweet gesture, and I suspect there were lots of others. Um, Trisha, thanks. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. That's really hard. Um, there hasn't been much good news, so let me let me pass along a little bit. We can tell you that the the the, the, the all clear has been given at both the Empire State Building and at Penn Station. I guess about 20 minutes after an evacuation order was given in those two buildings. Uh, the all clear has been given, and whatever it was, it's over, it's done, it's fine. Now, a little bit farther downtown uh, from where we are in Washington Square Park, there is, uh, and I think we have pictures of it, there we go, a vigil going on uh, tonight. Washington Square Park's one of the uh, quirkier places in the city. It's, it's a lovely and interesting area, and, and a, a, a fascinating assortment of people gather there. Uh, every day for all sorts of different reasons. Quirky is a generous way of describing Quir Washington Park, Aaron. Quirky is a, <laughs> I like to think of it as a thoughtful way. Uh, it, it doesn't require I explain much more. Um, but there's all sorts of interesting folks down there of all ages and uh, backgrounds, as you see in the city of New York. And they're just down there simply to pray and to stand together, to be together. Being together is one of the things that we as humans like to do in these moments. We we share our misery and our sorrow and our anger together, and we pray together in however we do that, and that's what's going on down in Washington Square Park right now. John Voss is uh, not too terribly far away from there, uh, a correspondent of ours down on the ground, and he can tell us a little bit more about what he has been seeing. John? Aaron, this has indeed been a very long day for this nation, for this city, but especially for the workers who are on that site, who are on their search and rescue mission, searching for bodies and hoping and praying to rescue people who may still be alive. We spoke with them as they left. They talk, they talk of a skittish atmosphere, much like when someone in a theatre yells up, jumps up and yells fire. That's the atmosphere down there. It, they are on a knife's edge. They talk about finding an American flag, pausing for a moment to salute it. They talk about the orange pieces of plastic which marks the spot where they find body parts or bodies and how when they look on that pile of debris it seems as if there is orange plastic almost every 10 feet. But perhaps the saddest story today we heard from a woman who was walking up and down West Street here. She was carrying photos, photos of a young man. She was trying to find him. She'd called all the telephone numbers, she'd called the 1-800 numbers, the hospitals, the police. No one had seen him. No one had seen her nephew. This is our last resort to see if there's somebody out there who, who knows anything about, you know, seeing him or knowing where he's at or seeing him, you know, in the building or whatever. And for them to call us and let us know. Obviously, feelings, great feelings of anxiety, which is shared by so many people in this city and in this nation tonight. Just to add what Brian was telling us about the dump trucks earlier tonight, they are moving in through here. There are hundreds of them. They were banked up. They were lined up all day today. They're going in empty, and they are coming out with debris. We are told they are taking that debris to barges where it is being handed over to the FBI, where they will sift through that debris looking for evidence. Aaron. John, thank you. John Voss uh, down in the at the ground zero area, a little four or five blocks back from it, uh, we guess, Paula. And Jeff Greenfold has just dropped by to share some of his thoughts on what the president is facing at this moment and what the uh, country will have to do or endure in the weeks to come. We were thinking about the president, what he was doing today, and, and you think back to last year's election, peace and prosperity seemed a fact of nature. We all said there are no big issues on the table. What real issues could a new president have to deal with? Now we know. And a question arises, how have past presidents dealt with crises, and how have those crises defined their presidencies? Political benefit. But when President Johnson escalated the war in Vietnam after an alleged attack on U.S. naval vessels, the resulting firestorm helped drive him into retirement. When it comes to patriotism... Richard Nixon had Middle America with him on the war in Vietnam. It was the Watergate scandal, of course, that sunk him. If Iran should release the hostages... Jimmy Carter's political defeat in 1980 was sealed by his failure to get American hostages out of Iran. And here's an instructive irony. Allied air forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq. 
President Bush's success in the Gulf War pushed his approval ratings past 90 percent. All right. But the resulting high oil prices and shaken consumer confidence led to a brief but politically fatal recession. Their legacy must be our lives. President Clinton, he never looked as presidential as when he led the nation in mourning after the Oklahoma City bombing. But maybe the past doesn't really tell us all that much. I mean, presidents have led us into war, but we've known who the enemy was and wh what the war was about. We've had presidents console us with losses, but never a loss this enormous and this, this threatening. So I think what we really can say, much as we look to history for guidance, this president, nine months into his term, is facing a challenge no other president has ever faced before. What are your thoughts about the, what the president had to say today when he toured the area surrounding the Pentagon? I think everything this president has done and said uh, is what he, he has to do and say, and it is going to get enormous support from all parts of the, the political uh, spectrum. The question is not what he says, but what happens in the weeks and months ahead, because this is not a patient nation. And I, what my point is that this country doesn't always support a president if he doesn't deliver. Uh, the piece we didn't see is that, um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, when he got us into World War II after Pearl Harbor, everybody supported him, but that war was prosecuted successfully. And so the question now is, what happens when people say, you've got to do something, we've got to strike, and then people say, do we really know who to strike at? I think this is an enormous challenge, more complicated maybe than any president has ever faced. And it strikes me that an interview I did earlier today with Secretary of State Colin Powell, he is preparing the nation for, for a long assault. He said this is not going to be over in a week or two. This is going to require the combined efforts of the United States and what he called uh, the world neighborhood or and world community. And look at what happens beyond even military action. Look at what happened just a few moments ago. The nervousness that runs through this country where anybody can make a phone call and evacuate at the Empire State Building and Penn Station. What happens when the commercial airlines get back into work and somebody calls some nut calls in a bomb case? How much more seriously will we get? How much more disruption? And that's what I mean by the uniqueness of this challenge. This president is facing not simply the need to take military action, not simply an enormous loss of life, but the, but the whole possibility of a, of a ripple of disruption throughout this country. Uh, I just don't, I can't think of a historical parallel to it. Jeff, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Around uh, the city of New York today, or tonight, there are uh, literally uh, hundreds of people, perhaps thousands of people in hospitals. Uh, they have been taken there over the, uh, mostly yesterday, early yesterday. They are being treated from uh, injuries that are as simple as uh, scrapes and bruises and as uh, serious as uh, you can imagine, as life-threatening as you can imagine. The medical correspondent today, Elizabeth Cohn, visited one of them, and here is her report. Andrew Zucker started his day Tuesday on the 86th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. After the first explosion, the one in the North Tower, his wife called. And he said, um, I'm okay, I'll call you back, and he hung up. But then his building blew up. If I know Andrew, he stopped to help somebody, and I don't even want to think about what happened, and I don't know what happened to him, but he's just not here. But thinks she must, because like many people who stood in line to find out about their missing loved ones, Erica says she still thinks her husband may still be alive. So while Erica worked the phones Wednesday, her sister, Naomi Konovich, and family friend Susan Feldman went out on a search, one hospital at a time, starting at New York University Medical Center, where there were no answers. Bellevue, I think, is on like 27th. It's only like three or four more blocks down. After Bellevue, on to Beekman Hospital. No one had seen him there either. Someone told us actually to go to the medical examiner's office. Sir. They told Naomi to gather dental records and hair samples in case they'd have to identify his body. They don't have lists of people who were found dead. They don't have anything. Late in the day, after buying a mask to keep out the dust circulating after all the explosions, she checked yet more public offices. Still, no one had heard of Andrew Zucker. They said there were a couple of John Doe's in the hospital. We're hoping to find that maybe one of them is him. In the end, a frustrated Naomi distributed flyers to the media. He's, he's about 6'1", heavy set with the big shoulders and a big chest. 
while her sister kept up the round of calls to the hospitals, to the morgue. If you do see him or, or you're with him, just tell him we all love him and just to hold in there. And we just want him to come home. We need him to come home. Elizabeth Cohen, CNN, New York. An odd or end, if you will. Um, one of our colleagues who lives over in Brooklyn woke up this morning and looked out in his backyard and scattered about were pieces. We're working off that camera. There we go. Here, hang on to that for me. Want me to just, hold that for you? Yeah, would you please? Thank you. Pieces of scraps of paper that had blown. You can see the edges of them. I hope you can see it at least. The edges of them singed. Uh, this comes from Cantor Fitzgerald, one of the, the investment firms uh, in the World Trade Center. Obviously, when the building blew and the paper flew, it scattered all over the area. It crossed the water and in and over to Brooklyn and into our friend and colleague's backyard today. And I wonder how many people around the area woke up to something like this. Well, for the first time, we are being told that uh, New Yorkers as far away as four miles from here are smelling that the stinging yeah. smoke that continues to come from uh, what is left of the World Trade Center. I think uh, you made a clear air in that area. It continues to be illuminated tonight. You'll just well, find that over my right I, shoulder where rescue workers yeah. are still on duty. When I was down there earlier today, the, the smell is, is indescribable and it is unforgettable. I mean, I, I, I hope never again to... Uh, to have it, uh, it's, it's absolutely awful, and I wouldn't even know how to begin to tell you what it smells like. It smells like nothing I've ever experienced, but I know I'll never forget it. Right now, uh, we'd like to share with you some of the thoughts of uh, Bruce Morton as he focuses in on how the nation uh, will have to continue to, to come to grips uh, with the magnitude of, of what has been handed us. House will be in order. Congress went back to work. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. People went to church trying to make sense of it all. God made us free, the homily said, to do good or evil. And people went back to work. In New York, exhausted rescue workers caught their breath. Signs said pray, and surely many did. And some just cried. Major League Baseball canceled all its games for the second straight day. New York's tunnels were closed. Airports looked ghostly. This was Dallas-Fort Worth. The limited flights for stranded people will resume. An odd day for those who work in airports. I've been here for almost, almost six months, and I've never, ever, I mean, it's almost peaceful. In Chicago at the Sears Tower, America's tallest building, it was business as usual. But some who work in it are worried. And this is the tallest building I ever work in. Normally the buildings I it would go like 21 or maybe 31, but this is the tallest and I'm terrified. Newspaper headlines offered a sample of reaction to the terror, pretty straightforward mostly. The San Francisco Examiner was just plain angry. And on talk radio, this is San Francisco's KGO, people, this man said he was an airline pilot, talked. What more do you need? I mean, do we need to have the Capitol uh, taken out and the, uh, you know, joint session of Congress before, before you know, this thing can turn nuclear? I, I mean, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just so furious over it. Back in Washington, the mall looked empty except for accidental tourists, a stranded Australian. This is uh, just a terrible thing, and uh, clearly it's a threat to all of us, uh, to our safety, and uh, it's a threat to democracy. A woman from Topeka wondering how to get home. Is there a train? I don't even know. Yeah, we okay. don't have trains in Kansas. <laughs> a student. Just to see so many police officers everywhere, everywhere you go, National Guards out on some of the streets, it's, it's, it's eerie. Lots of flags, all at half-staff. Walmart sold 88,000 this day, 6,000 on the same day last year. At the Capitol's railroad station, a sign people could sign, and did. And a street musician playing a bugle call he probably hadn't played in years. Sadness and tiredness, back to work, still grieving, but determined. 
Bruce Morton, CNN, Washington.